Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Adobe Live. And my name is Robert Ranitsky, and I'm your host today. And I'm so excited to be back on the UK stream. So uh, a wonderful hello to everyone uh, joining here in the stream. Um, today, I have the wonderful Hazel Mead here with me. And hello, Hazel. Hello. Nice to join you on a stream. Absolutely. We haven't had the pleasure yet, so mm -hmm. I'm even more excited to you know, to have something fresh going on in the stream, at least at least for, for myself. Um, actually, I've been looking through some of your work and, um, you know, saw you on the on the uh, on the YouTube uh, thumbnails. Uh, so it's a, it's a familiar name. So um, I'm super happy to have you here. And let's see who is joining. I, I think we have a full house here. Um, let's see. We have Sandrine, Jack, Humicorn, Jane. I also saw Andreas. Um, Sean is here. Annika, hello everyone, uh, good to see you all. And uh, if you are watching on YouTube, make sure to hop over on Behance where you will also be uh, able to chat with us and ask any questions and, and drop a comment. I'll be happy to uh, uh, go through them and uh, direct any uh, questions or comments uh, your way um, so we can have it a little bit more interactive instead of just a, a monologue or like a dialogue. So uh, feel free to join on Behance and uh, um, give us some uh, some questions and, and anything that you'd like to know from from Hazel or myself. So um, yeah, so what what's what's the topic today, Hazel? Uh, so the topic today is kind of going to be a session for if you're still struggling to find your style, or maybe you've got a style and you feel a bit stuck in it. So hopefully, a few tips uh, and tricks to try some new things. And I think I just want to show you how. I've developed my style um, mm -hmm. over time and what my go-tos are. And how mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, one question that I that I'm personally interested in, um, since I'm you know pretty much new to your to your work, um, I've, I've when I went through your work, I, I noticed that they look quite quite analog, which which I like. So it looks always. I mean, it doesn't look too too clean and too digital and too sterile yeah. and i was wondering i mean obviously you're drawing a lot with fresco but is it are you are you drawing exclusively digitally emulating the analog world or do you do both or how do you split up your you know your digital versus analog work um so for now i'm completely uh, digital actually uh, but I didn't always start off with that way I think maybe uh, someone that's seen me before on the stream um, I've talked about how I used to be an oil painter actually mm -hmm. um, so I was completely analog and I'd never done any digital illustration until I went to university and that was kind of where I started doing a little bit of both um, mm -hmm. so I draw my line work on paper scan it in and color digitally mm -hmm. and then when I started getting clients I realized that's a a lot of time that I could cut out and I just transferred um, over to digital but mm -hmm. for me it was really important to kind of keep um, a bit of a sketchy look uh, because I didn't want it to look necessarily totally digital so mm -hmm. I think with fresco and with Kyle's brushes actually there's a lot of room to play with different textures and yeah keeping some of the painterly feel. Um, that's that's fantastic I, I think um, to me, it always it, it always gives more life to to an artwork. I mean, it, of course, completely digital, super crisp line art also has its charm. Um, but personally, I always like it when it's a little bit grungy and a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more more lively. I think it it, it adds authenticity to it. But how do you what do you think in terms of understanding analog versus digital i mean how much like for example if if someone and this could be interesting for anyone that is watching that is an aspiring artist or is still studying or you know wanting to get into into illustration i'm wondering how much should you have you know drawn analog on paper with oil with with actual colors with with pencils um to to get a feel for the paper and for the color and for the actual material in order to understand it for digital? I mean, do, how, what do you think? How, how important is that? Or is it is it important at all? I mean, that's... Oh, it's tricky to say because I would say you could easily just go straight to digital. Mm -hmm. But 
for me, I think I got a lot out of exploring other materials. Um, I'd work in charcoal and things mm -hmm. and having that understanding of how paint works as well. Like sometimes mm -hmm. I'd um, take that method uh, and use that digitally as well. So kind of building mm -hmm. up colors underneath and then layering like the skin tone on top. It's not just like one color that you've got in your, mm -hmm. in your skin, there's like blood and um, mm -hmm. veins going on. Um, so I think, yeah, there's definitely benefits of starting analog and there's something a bit more scary, I think, about um, completely analog because you've got a rubber, but if you're working in paints, you can't just undo. Yeah. Which I think we, maybe, maybe me especially, I rely on just being able to undo or double tap on the iPad. And I've gone back to a life drawing class or something and I've tried to double tap on the page and I thought, oh, dear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's, I mean, it's part of your creative process. You know, it takes away some of, like you say, some of the fear of doing a wrong stroke or not hitting hitting the shape at the same moment. And, um, but at the same time, it also, it, I mean, it, it, I see your point and it totally has a good and a bad. Because uh, when, when I remember back at, at drawing class in, in, in university, I always, what our, our professor said is always like do multiple lines with with the pencil or with charcoal back then when you had um mm -hmm. uh what do you call it when you um when you draw uh in german it's aktzeichen when you draw nudes right what do you call it when you have like uh, not a portrait but you know someone is posing and you draw the body uh life drawing life drawing yeah life drawing when we had life drawing it always like okay you have to find the shape by narrowing it down to the stroke with you know thin and light strokes until until you hit the, the the proper proportion and the proper shape. So it's kind of like nearing it down and refining it. And the more you have a better feeling for the actual stroke, the, the thicker or the stronger the stroke, the stroke gets. So I, I found that really helpful to you know, be like liberating and not just be like, okay, I have to hit the the shape at the very same, at the very exact, exact moment. You know what I mean? So uh, That's really has... interesting because I had the opposite advice because- Oh, really? I still draw like that with a few yeah. strokes and quite tentatively, that is my under sketch. And sometimes I like leaving that, um, but sometimes I'll draw over the top and um, refine a bit. Um, but I remember my lecturer would say, no, none of this. We, you want to show your confidence in your drawing. So it's just one stroke. Uh, and even if you get it wrong, just own it. And so that was- uh, Nice, okay. I think I probably reverted back to you know, having a few few lines because that's just how I draw. Oh, that's super interesting to to hear, actually. I mean, there's there's no right or wrong, really. I guess. I mean, it's art, so technically, exactly. anything that gets the <laughs> job done and, and gets a beautiful picture out is 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 probably right. I mean, it's your way, and I mean, certainly the things that you'll be showing and you're telling us and the audience today is 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 your way. There's, so there's you don't claim that this is like the ultimate way, which I think is is super <laughs> nice to know. And this is why we're watching, you know, things like this to to get inspired, and and even even if it doesn't apply 100 to your work, I mean, like your our guests' work, you still can pick up a few things here and there that might inspire you for your personal way. So um, I'd say let's let's take it away and um, let's see let's see what you'll you'll be coming up with um, in fresco today. Let's do it. Um, so when I was thinking about this session, I was thinking, um, okay, how would I like separate it out into building blocks of um, of style and how I kind mm -hmm. of come up with my style. And this isn't necessarily style, but I think it's important um, in deciding what do you like to draw. Um, and if you're a commercial illustrator or want to become a commercial illustrator, what do you want to be commissioned to draw? Um, mm -hmm. And I used to think that I had to draw backgrounds. Um, even though I didn't like drawing backgrounds. And then someone said to me ba once- Backgrounds as in patterns or? Um, backgrounds as in um, like having lots of detail going on, like maybe I have to draw a whole scene. Um, mm -hmm. I really enjoy drawing people. That's mm -hmm. what I enjoy. And yeah, someone said to me, why don't you just take out the background, like put um, just a plain block of color or put a mm -hmm. texture. Uh, and so that's what I draw now. And okay. And that um, 
choice to take out backgrounds and stop drawing backgrounds has led to me being commissioned to do more work without backgrounds and that's sort of what I've become known for and I didn't realize it was that easy like if you don't like drawing something maybe just mm -hmm. you don't have to um, but what, what yeah. one thing one thing I noticed um, when going through your work and especially through the topic that we discussed in our um, in, in preparation for our session today um, to me there's two parts for, for for your style or finding your own way and and one is the actual style you know like the actual how does the line look like how does your art look like which colors is it colorful mm -hmm. or is it you know desaturated or whatever but also the actual the actual content the actual concept the actual heart and thought that goes into it is also part of your style right because i mean yeah. obviously for your for your work you're You're, you're trying to to raise awareness for certain you know certain things that that are more taboo uh, taboos in in regions so that's also your style regardless of how you actually do the stroke right mm -hmm. so there's there's actually two parts to that to decide on what your style is going to be yeah yeah definitely and that's another thing um that you kind of become become known for mm -hmm. um, so you have the look of it and you have the subject matter mm -hmm. and then you tend to What I've found in my experience, you tend to attract the clients that also want to talk about the same subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so a lot of my work will be about inclusivity and showing like, all different body types, um, all ethnicities. Like, that's something I really try and focus on in my work. And then, yeah, tackling taboo subjects that you wouldn't mm -hmm. usually talk about. But I think my the style and actually how I draw kind of makes the subject matter a little bit easier to tackle because as, as you will see in a second it's quite um cartoonish cute and, mm -hmm. and colorful nice yeah um so when i was thinking about what what to draw i was just going to draw a fairy because why not sounds good to me <laughs> um and i was just going to show you how i um built up my um the visual look of mm -hmm. how i draw Uh, so I'm just going to go into the pixel brushes. And as we spoke about earlier, me and Rachel um, Presky, when we're on a stream, we always laugh because we both use the pencil kind of quite mm -hmm. rapidly. Um, but as we spoke about earlier, it does have that nice organic, mm -hmm. that traditional feel uh, to it. And as you can see, I do use quite a few lines um, when I'm getting that initial sketch down. Cause you know, you know, that you the shapes inside out, right? So you hit, I mean, I think it's, it's always impressive to watch illustrators work and hit, you know, hit the line. Like you said, with one line that is so confident, you're like, okay, yeah, that's, that's the shape. There's no discussion, you know, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I kind of figure it out as I go along. So I'm, I always use a uh, reference photo. So I've got my phone mm -hmm. up here and I'm just um, sort of using an, a photo as a guide of how to draw. And then I kind of just figure out the shapes that go along. Mm -hmm. uh, so just put the arms in. So here's a question to the audience. Uh, maybe you can write it in the comments. How much, how much do you rely on under sketches versus hitting the line right away? Uh, who's who's doing what? I'd like to see what what everyone else is doing. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see. While well, uh, Hazel is uh, is going crazy with some super on point lines here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. We'll see. We'll see. Um, but yeah, you get to see how I build up the sketch. And already, I'm double tapping. Like, no, that's not quite right. But there is something really nice about an under sketch, and when things don't look so perfect. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, uh, yeah, I'll try and keep that quality. I think over time, actually, some, I was looking through some of my older work and I was noticing, oh, you know what? I used to be even rougher, uh, like with, with sketching. Mm -hmm. And I quite like that. And so I think, oh, maybe I should bring some of that back. And sometimes I'll make it look more sketched on purpose as well. Mm. And for this drawing, do you have it already in your mind, like what the pose should be, or do you just start with the head and decide on the go? Um, no, I would um, have an idea of pose and then mm -hmm. 
kind of roughly sketch it out and then maybe change it a little bit later. Mm -hmm. oh, and another thing is, you know, if it's too big for the page, you can mm -hmm. just resize You run it. out of space. <laughs> yeah, I've already run out of space. There we go, the legs. Is anyone drawing along today with... I don't see comments of anyone drawing along, but I have a question um, of uh, Akanksha. She asks, uh, how did you learn drawing figures yourself on your own? Ooh. How, how do you learn draw drawing figures yourself on your own? Um, how do you learn? So when I was really little, I think I just had lots of those books, like how to draw a person, mm -hmm. how to split up, um, a figure into the right proportions and shapes. And I think it depends how exactly you want to draw figures, like whether you want to draw something that looks a little bit realistic or whether you want to do something a bit stylized. And mm -hmm. so my proportions are actually probably quite correct um, and not that stylized. And that was something I used to not enjoy about my own work I would look at other artists work and think oh they they make their faces look so interesting mm -hmm. uh, eyes were really big and dramatic and the heads were tiny but the arms were like really nice shapes um and it's kind of up to you whether you go down that route of trying to make something mm -hmm. really stylized or whether you want to go um a bit more traditional sorry I just mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's just a series of choices so if you start with some kind of life drawing you look at a photo and you sort of think to yourself okay so this this leg is this long but what if I do you know what if I make it a shape what if I like make exaggerate the knee and make mm -hmm. it really tiny and then exaggerate the calf and I think it's just a process of looking at what you see mm -hmm. and then deciding what you want to do with that, how accurately you want to stick to that. There are loads of um, advice on how to like, separate the face and you can go that way, but also just play around, I think. Um, yeah, sorry. Do you know what my my biggest um, like Eureka moment was? Like, oh my God, this is it um, yeah. in, in design school and especially for drawing class. What was that? It was understanding the difference between looking and seeing. Mm. You know, like just looking at a, at a shape or, you know, like, let's say if I, if I have my hand like right here, uh -huh. you, know, you see that my hand is here, but you actually understand the perspective shift of how the lines go, you know, to the back. And that's the difference between, you know, visualizing shape and perspective and everything versus just looking at it right yeah and kind of getting the dimensions and like where mm -hmm. it's in the space yeah to explain what what is going on so i think and did you know that tim can also draw i did i've seen him draw i what, what did i see him draw i think it was a light bulb once yeah you know what he can also draw he can draw conclusions that's what he writes <laughs> oh is he in the chat yeah he was posting that that uh, was a little bit that was flat but i think so fitting <laughs> <laughs> um okay so yeah when, once i've sort of done the body i'm fairly happy with that actually mm -hmm. that'll do. That'll do. um for the for the fairy um i go on to faces and i think this is actually one of the visual elements that I think you could say would, I don't want to say define my work, like it's all in a face, but I always draw the eyes closed. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, I think it was just that I tried drawing them open and I just couldn't decide on how to make them look good. Uh, so I just always draw them closed and that's just one feature, mm -hmm. one, one design choice that I made and something that I think can be recognizable. There's also something sensual to it, I think, you know, when when they have their eyes closed. And... Yeah, it's sort of sensual, but not like heavily erotic. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when I am dealing with more adult subject matters, this is how I can 
kind of make it a little bit less in your face mm-hmm. um, and keep quite sweet and uh, and playful with it as well. Right. So you put the the face is always on a separate layer for you? Um, no, I don't know why I did that actually. <laughs> But it's a little bit big, I think, so I can just resize that. And I'm, yeah, I'll actually merge that down. I thought it's like um, to me it made to me it made sense like okay of course the faces because like you said now you can scale it up and down without having to worry about the rest. Yeah, no, that that was just an accident. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so now I think I will go over so I just lower the opacity and do another sketch on top mm-hmm. and then here you can maybe like more define the shoulders and make it look like I'm, I've been a bit more confident with line work mm-hmm. okay so that was your your pre-sketch technically You always, I mean, do you have a special technique for drawing hands or you always take it as you, depends on, on whatever, the, uh, like the what you want to have with the hands or do you focus on hands a lot or? Um, so this is another thing that it just depends on the day, how lazy I'm feeling um, and how many hands are in the piece and how much time mm-hmm. I've got uh, because hands are always tricky, I think. Mm-hmm. Most artists will agree. Absolutely. Tricky. So I, in my head, I just always have this vague idea of the shape of the hands. Um, but hands especially, I make extra sketchy so that they're sort of there, but you mm-hmm. don't focus the, on them too mm-hmm. much. And because usually um, with my illustrations, it wouldn't just be one figure. The piece would be like lots and lots of different figures. The hands aren't a necessary detail. They don't necessarily they don't add to the illustration. So I'll mm-hmm. keep them quite, as you can see, it's not perfect hands. Sandrine has a very interesting approach to this. Um, she says, I always draw hands in pockets, which is which is a good way of uh, yeah. getting around that. <laughs> I think there's also a, a really famous artist that couldn't draw hands, like one of the uh, masters, I think. Oh, really? Okay. I can't remember who it was. Um, and you'll never see him draw hands. They're always behind the back or hidden somewhere. Let me do a quick Google search. Yeah. I remember hearing that. I can't remember who it, who it is. Michelangelo had trouble using his hands, um, apparently. Oh. oh, what am I going to do? Huh. That's going to be a, a Google search. Or maybe maybe Tim can do some research while we go. Yes. <laughs> okay, so you add another layer there that you didn't have in your in your underlying sketch. Yeah, I thought I'd just give her some clothes. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um So I've kind of gone for, I think these are going to be leaves. I think it's going to be a flower, flower fairy. So you animate as well, Robert? I do, yeah. Actually, that's what I do mostly. Um, Like I went through classic design school, doing all the sketching, photography, typography, layout, design, everything. And... Oh, wow. So, you know, everything. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't, uh, yeah, a little bit, but um, yeah, but it has, has settled with animation because basically it combines everything together. So you have to have an understanding of multiple disciplines, um, you know, light and uh, timing, um, shapes, uh, you know, typography, everything helps, everything comes in yeah. into my work that, that, that helps to be to be a better creator for, for that particular subject that I'm doing, you know, which is animation, that part, a lot of motion graphics and yeah. So there's a lot to, there's a lot to animation uh, because when I was, I think I was about seven or eight, I decided I want, wanted to be an animator. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
so for a long time I that's what I wanted to do um and then I realized how much work goes into animation <laughs> oh yeah and how my level of patience didn't necessarily line up with that that's a that's a very good point with with patience because that's that's still the hardest part I mean apart from the mental strain to visualize pre-visualize something in your in your head before it's actually on on screen before it actually moves yeah. is to have the idea of how it should move and what it should do and what you want to to communicate with it um that's that's super hard but then again everything that you animate has to be either rendered so you have to to play the waiting game mm -hmm. or if you do it frame by frame um as last week uh where I was on the stream with Melanie, where she was doing frame by frame animation in fresco. It's like, you have to, you have to draw every single frame, like back in the days, like, um, you know, like the Disney animations, for example, you know, like where you go frame by frame and uh, it's just, it's just what, I mean, so much work. And um, I mean, even if you do 3d work, you, you don't have to animate frame by frame, but then you still have to wait for the render to finish. And then it's always, it's always a patience game that, that you end up playing, which is sometimes a little bit strenuous. Mm -hmm. I remember at uni, um, so we had the illustration course, but so I was fine art illustration, but it was an illustration animation course. And uh, that was sort of next to us in parallel with mm -hmm. us. And the computers were always, please do not touch, it's rendering like overnight, mm -hmm. or they'd be doing everything by hand and like with a light box and doing another frame and another frame and another frame and it's just yeah or, or inspiring i think that's the that's the word totally so i have a a, a kankshash writes um my figures are fine until i draw faces and she laughs um hmm. so sandrine says that's a good start though which which i agree to you know it's it's like don't i would i would say don't put yourself too much under pressure to to be perfect right away with everything you know some people might be able to draw faces better than they can draw, draw bodies or shapes overall and yeah definitely i think everyone has a little nemesis of what they're not quite as good at and mm -hmm. um maybe even own that if, if you mm -hmm. can't draw faces maybe make that style your thing mm -hmm. make it a stylistic choice um Otherwise, do I have any tips for faces? I guess it's that thing about looking and then seeing. It's mm -hmm. because I think as an artist and illustrator, you really have to be observant. And that's one of my favorite things to do is, it sounds a bit creepy, but just going out and looking at how faces work and how they're different. And especially yeah. when, when you go on holiday and you go to a different country, um, I went to Malta and I just noticed everyone had the same knows and i just found mm -hmm. it really fascinating so mm -hmm. just having that kind of obsession with um your subject matter i think yeah really helps and that's yeah sorry that, that's exactly <laughs> the point uh, what i mean with with looking and seeing you know like really not just look at things but try to understand like why does why does a nose look this from the front but this from the side and how does understanding the shape of it uh, influence you know lighting and shadows and everything else you know i think i think that's that's a very interesting um thing to do and uh, eventually ultimately it will make you a better artist yeah definitely i think that does come with it did come with a lot of the traditional training i had um with the with painting and i think that really taught me how to see um because and and with life drawing because you'd have a teacher and although it sounds um like quite strict or quite traditional it was really helpful you'd have a teacher coming around going oh this is wrong this angle's wrong like have you really looked at that nose why is that nose not working and it mm -hmm. makes you think in a different way um so when you're on your own and maybe this is a good tip as well. If you are really struggling with something, just ask a friend who's also creative or just someone else that can see it differently um, to what you're seeing. Like, why is this not working? If you can't see it, if you're too close to it, just ask someone else. Mm -hmm. That's a very good tip to, to get some outside 
perspective and help and recommendation. I mean, something that is constructive and not just like, I like it or I don't like it. I mean, yeah. neither of that really help because you want to you want to become better. And so I think it's always a good point to to, to ask for honest feedback, um, but even online, you know, but online it's always risky of getting bashed too much. Um, you know, people saying like, oh, this is crap or this doesn't look good. But um, you should filter out the the valid feedback where some people are giving you useful tips you know like hey own it like you say own this if, if make it your style or definitely and um the I'm, i think i'm quite lucky in that you know i went to university with a load of artists mm -hmm. um so i can bounce that off um certain friends and they'll be honest with me like oh mm -hmm. that's not working i think you should do this and that's really useful but um i know there's also a discord chat um going around uh for anyone listening Mm -hmm. uh, nobody live so i feel like that's probably a great place to ask advice and i know there's a little community that right, we heard the same names earlier mm -hmm. in joining the stream um so i'd say use each other and absolutely and one, one thing that i find interesting also as we talk about faces is the way that you draw noses for example because mm -hmm. um to me the the nose that you see here is more like um like a half profile kind of nose although she looks straight up um yeah. so that's also something that is that might be considered technically a little bit wrong but then again you that's the way that you decide to to draw it because because you want to <laughs> yeah i think um i don't know where that came from but i my default go-to nose is actually my own nose <laughs> i think so i think did i draw my nose this time kind of like with this little slopey bit mm -hmm. um, and I've just always added that onto faces but every now and then I'll kind of catch myself and think no wait let's change it up like this character mm -hmm. is gonna have that nose and then just bash a different nose on and I think uh it's it's interesting when you're drawing faces because a lot of time a lot of the time people will draw faces that are similar to their own so I think mm -hmm. that's why it's good to go out and you know study noses draw a different nose Let's draw a different eyes. But yeah, I will draw the, let's move them out. I will draw uh, the side profile. Mm -hmm. Nice. Just because I enjoy that. There we go. And I've already completely changed the face just by moving mm -hmm. it slightly. So if you it's find yourself, completely. yeah, if you find you're st stuck in drawing a certain face and you're not enjoying that, just change one thing and see what you can what you can do with that. Okay, I think I'm happy with the line work. Um, so let's pick a skin color. Oh no, let's do the thing I was talking about earlier with um, building up colors. Sandrine was uh, so kind to find a, a little YouTube video about an animator, Joanna Kin, and how she animates. And you can see her animate frame by frame on her on her light table. So uh, that's posted in the in the chat if anyone is interested. So that's uh, that seems like a cool video. I will check it out after the stream. Thank you for that. Always like little helpful tips and tricks here. Mm -hmm. Shared resources. Such a nice community. So tell me about how you layer colors. So you start with the darker colors um, as you should? I actually kind of make a little rainbow uh, mm -hmm. under the skin. So um, yeah, I'll use purples. I don't use this technique often unless I'm doing like one figure because with one figure, um, you see more of it and you see more of the colors. Whereas mm -hmm. when I do lots of little ones, there's not too much point in doing this. Mm -hmm. It would be an extra load of work, but I, I enjoy doing this technique and this is how I used to paint as well. Uh, yeah, so I'll build up the 
some darker colors, um, and maybe some bluey greens as well. It's funny, I, I, I just observed some some behavior on, on myself right now because people yeah. are wondering like why I squint my eyes sometimes. <laughs> um, I, I do that quite often with, with work, um, the, the, the squint eye technique or whatever, you know, I do it with, with multiple things, um, you know, just to, you know, to either go back or, or both or, and squint your eyes and to see what carries through um, if you don't look so sharply onto it. Um, huh. this, this helps, at least for me, it helps me to, to visualize it differently, to, to see, okay, how does the, does the silhouette carry over or does the, 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 the title look good? Do you, can you still read the, the shape or uh, the physicality of it or, you know? Ah, oh, that's really interesting. I think that's a great um, technique as well. You know, also if, if I look at the thumbnail here on, on my Zoom window, you know, I have this really, really tiny preview of your work and still i mean it's super small but i can totally see that okay it's a person that has the arms um you know spread across and it has long hair so you can you can already Great. you can already understand <laughs> that and if you understand it that easily that that is a good sign usually mm, i feel like that's probably really good for things like poster design or uh, mm -hmm. oh, especially it's actually one of my mum's bugbears. It's when, uh, well, I'm sure it's loads of people's, um, but I got a leaflet through the other day and it was like a black background with red text on it. And I was really squinting. Uh, mm -hmm. I got good eyesight and I thought, why have they done that? And mm -hmm. I think that's probably another great tip for design. Like, is this understandable? Like, Absolutely, because you only have like so much time when you're driving a car and you look at a billboard or whatever, or on TV or... The attention span is so, so short, so you want to make sure that you that you hit the nerve quite quite fast. So we have um, a few more people coming into the into the stream. It's wonderful. Uh, I see Karina here. Hello, oh. um, Jackie came in. So it's good to see everyone. And by the way, if you're watching, if you're still watching on YouTube, um, hop over and over to to Behance, where we have the wonderful community and all the chat going on so if you have any questions or anything that you want to comment uh, again let us know and i'll be happy to forward it on to hazel yes please uh, so the other thing i find important to do is kind of have this pinky undertone as well and i'll probably go back over the top with that and you'll you'll notice uh quite a few illustrators do this as well um, and this is probably an observant thing um, so as not to just have like one flat skin color you kind of pick out like the fingertips or the the cheeks or the nose and things um, as the places where you know you're going to get that like, slight flush and it, mm -hmm. I think it adds a nice um, look to it uh, and then hopefully this will work and then I'll pick kind of a skin color this is always the hard bit for figuring out what yeah that seems good. and then i'll just go in and mm -hmm. mainly cover it but also leave some of those colors showing through so they blend wonderfully because you use the the brush yeah i always think um these lives are a great opportunity to use these oil brushes mm -hmm. they're, they're just really nice to watch so yeah absolutely i'm doing today karina is also giving some wonderful feedback saying that she finds it very interesting to see different workflows and that's again something that that i mentioned before you know even even though you you might be an acclaimed illustrator yourself you still see someone else work where you pick up bits and pieces where you go like oh okay i could try this for myself or this or that Definitely. And actually, it's funny Karina's come on today because um, I was thinking about, oh, what illustrator styles do I like? What do I find really interesting? And I was going to bring up um, Karina because mm -hmm. one thing I absolutely love is seeing how different illustrators show movement um, mm -hmm. and add um, sort of electricity to their work. And she has this, I don't know how she does it, but like these little lines 
um, that she uses, like with mm -hmm. colors, and it just adds this vibrancy. And I think, oh, that is that's really smart, and that's a mm -hmm. really nice touch. And I think it's her style, and you know, that's yeah. that's her fingerprint for that. Yeah, it's her style, and I think that's a really interesting sort of stylistic choice. That it's one thing but it makes you stand out and mm -hmm. if you can pick one thing that you do differently to everyone else that makes you go oh that's that person mm -hmm. that's recognizable i think that's you're onto a winner there jackie writes not being a fine artist i put the shadows in afterwards it's always it always it's always fascinating to her to see hazel's process like that yeah, I think you can do do either. But when I'm using the oil paints, I think, oh, let's use it as oil paint. And mm -hmm. I would um, build from dark, dark to light. Mm -hmm. But then the nice thing about oil painting digitally is um, oil painting digitally is that you can just keep going over the top. You can make new layers. You don't have to wait for it to dry. You can. Mm -hmm. So maybe, oh, I want some more dark on this side. So I'll mm -hmm. go in with some more purple and add that after. Very nice. Nice, I think that's... Karina says also, um, she's very flattered and uh, it makes her happy to hear that uh, kind feedback from your end. So I just wanted to pass yeah, that on. Really <laughs> I always love, love seeing your work on, on my Instagram feed. So would you go over and over this now with some some lighter color or how would you what would be the next steps for this yeah so usually um i would have a color and then i'd have shading and then i'd have uh lighter lighter tones mm -hmm. uh, on top just to make it feel like it's in some kind it's not just flat it's in mm -hmm. some kind of setting with some sort of light on it and i always do uh, as you've seen i've done here like shadows to the bottom left and mm -hmm. the light source is coming from the top so it's if you want to add lighting and things um, it's useful to imagine that where's the light source coming from and keep that consistent um, yeah I'm sure you know plenty about that <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so what colors yeah I'll probably just pick a bit of a lighter lighter skin color and then I don't know if I'll just you work on a new layer. Mm -hmm. It's in Dream comments that for the very little oil painting I did, the underpaint, white or gray, was very important. It makes the colors on top react differently. Yeah. Although I didn't paint enough to really understand how it worked. Yeah, so I think actually uh, Fresco does do a good job of replicating how it works. So mm -hmm. you can see that um, I did just go in with that um, sort of brownish skin color over the top mm -hmm. and different areas have reacted differently. Um, so the kind of bluey greeny colors, um, because they're cooler colors, like the, um, they'll sink to the back a little bit, whereas the pinkier ones sort of come forward so that's mm -hmm. like i've done this very quickly but that's the idea of how you're gonna bring some depth like make some parts of it sink back and some parts of it spring out to your eye cool. hazel that's to give you a little uh, update on on how we're doing with time we have about 15 to 20 minutes left so just to give you a little bit on uh, an overview no that's fine um because i think i'm just gonna add some petals. Maybe I'll try watercolor, um, color in her hair, and then I think that's done. And we can just keep chatting about, you know, how how to build style. If anyone else has got any questions, um, revolving around that. I did have so many notes that I was going to go through, but we, you know, the conversation goes how it goes. You can't plan it. <laughs> well, I mean, we're we're happy to go through your notes if you want to. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I just um, separated it into stages. So like, what you enjoy drawing is the first step. And then, yeah, the series of choices. So what brushes you're going to use, um, how you're going to draw expression, perspective, um, 
what kind of tone and feel you're going for. Like you said earlier, that this sort of has a bit of a sensual feel, mm -hmm. um, which, yeah, I think for the subject matter of my work, that works really well, actually. Mm -hmm. Totally. So you you do have your go-to brushes and you're like, like you said, you, you use Kai's uh, pencil brush and um, that keeps your, keeps your style also your style, technically. Yeah, um, exactly. So my usual step is the line work, the coloring, and then um, the background. Mm -hmm. So I said I didn't have background, but I'll show you what I do for my background. I will, mm -hmm. um, I'll just kind of pick a color. And a lot of the time that's working to, um, if I'm working with a brand, it will be their colors. They'll mm -hmm. provide me with some colors. I was working with um, a very harsh gradient the other day. It was very mm -hmm. bold and in your face. Uh, and I did I did actually ask whether we could tone it down a bit because it was one of my pieces with lots and lots of different things going on. Uh, and they said, yeah, that's fine. And yeah, it's just use, it's just interesting to see how you can maintain your style within the context of working with a brand. And I think that's why it's important not just to have your style as I use these colors. There's so mm -hmm. many more elements to it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a very good point. Actually, it's it's good that you mentioned because I read that uh, also in our um, briefing that that was one of the, the topics um, or the points that stuck out to me, um, especially keeping your style while keeping the client happy you know it's kind of like because sometimes it's not so easy to to have this go hand in hand because you know the yeah. client might be you know might, might want to have something totally different but at the same time the client hired you so finding that balance i can imagine is sometimes super hard um i mean it's 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 just as hard for animation but i can imagine that for you it's also really hard because you know how, how do you how do you approach how do you communicate that with the client uh, so I'm, because I'm not particularly tied to any colors in particular, mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to take on their um, brand guidelines and their um, color scheme mm -hmm. and their fonts even. Like, you know, if they have a specific font that they need and they use everywhere else, I'll, I'll take it on. Um, mm -hmm. But they usually just trust me to draw how I draw because they're used to, um, yeah, my my style. So they know exactly nice. what they're getting. Um, and I'd say, yeah, just try and keep a few things like maybe it is your expression or maybe it is the brushes you use. Usually clients aren't too fussed about that. Maybe they're mm -hmm. like, for, you know, a strong black line or something. But how much how much do you I mean, do you finish your work in fresco exclusively? Like, is it like fresco in and out? That's it. Or do you touch it up in Illustrator sometimes, or let's say in that case, when it's bitmap based, is it Photoshop more, or is it is it just fresco out of the iPad and that's it? It depends. Um, actually, usually if there's text involved, um, which many of my illustrations do have text, I will do that in Photoshop because I quite like to bend the text. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also just become a stylistic thing for me. <laughs> Um, let me just show you, because I've also brought some of my work that I've done earlier. Cool. Um, I think I think you can multi-select and do this. Um, but I'm just going to do that. Um, okay, so the. So yeah, you'll notice that I kind of bend bend the text sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and that would, uh, for me, be one of the things that you can identify. Oh, okay, that's probably a Hazel Mead illustration because mm -hmm. the text is bent. Um, and you'll notice that I'm doing the same thing. Um, I'll have sort of nothing in the background, but it usually be a color with a gradient. And that would uh, sprinkle with some some uh, color drops here, which I really like. Exactly. And for ages, I was like, that is my only thing. Until I kind of dissected the look of my style, I realized, okay, no, there's so much more than just the color drops. Um, mm -hmm. 
but yeah if if you wanted to copy my style i'll tell you the exact brush i use it's the <laughs> i've been using it for years it's the supreme spatter there we go oh wow <laughs> all my secrets <laughs> here you go and she's spilling all the secrets to you oh oh that's definitely one of mine <laughs> Um, yeah. You always use it opposite, or is it sometimes just whatever uh, you want? I usually do it quite a few times until I'm happy that it's mm -hmm. sort of spread around a little bit. Like it looks like it's been spattered with some ink. <laughs> no, I think it's I think it's wonderful because it adds again. It adds to that, you know, making it look less digital. Um, and as yeah. I said before, I mean, looking at your work, uh, I mean, obviously I knew that you are working a lot digitally and a lot with fresco and everything, but from 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 some of your work in your portfolio, for some some work, I couldn't tell, like, is this really digital or is it maybe analog? Which I think is a good thing because it actually doesn't matter because it's just good work, right? And it shouldn't, it shouldn't matter. That means a lot to me, actually, because um, I really just, I love digital art, but my favorite styles of art are actually mm -hmm. traditional ink drawings. Mm -hmm. And for ages, um, I tried to kind of copy it, but I wasn't very good at it. And mm -hmm. I made peace with the fact that this is how I draw, this is my style. And I can add elements of that that I like. So I can pick a brush that is a bit looser um, and I can pick, you know, this spattery brush spattery brush that makes it look a little bit more inky um and that's fine you know people are going to know that as my style i'd rather do this i've just yeah i've decided i'd rather do this than be kind of a second rate version of someone else mm -hmm. um and i think when you're starting out that's difficult to grapple with as well because you'll see other people's work and you'll think oh I love how they do this or, and especially at uni I remember kind of trying to emulate some other artists that I really admired and at some point I just came to the conclusion it's better not to just try and copy someone it, you know like take something that you like from them like oh I like the sketchiness of their work mm -hmm. and, that's yeah. that's a good approach, but I think I mean everyone, everyone is I mean everyone that is serious about art and design and illustration and even filmmaking. I mean is 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 taking clue, clues and inspiration and from from other artists. I mean, yeah, you could you could call it stealing, but then again, it I, I think it's not as easily said than done because it's. I mean, it's a fine line between stealing and being inspired by. I think I think there was a quote that says like, if you take if you steal something from one source, then it's then it's actually really just a rip off copying it. But if you if you take a little bit from this artist and a little bit from that and a little bit from this, so you basically take multiple multiple sources and you combine them in your head and with with your hands and your heart and your soul. Basically, it makes it makes your makes it your style that is influenced by this person or that person or this artist or that artist. Yeah, definitely. I think there's some that that's a really good differentiation to make as well. Like there's inspiration, but then what I was doing at uni it was I was copying. <laughs> mm. and which is I get which is fine, I think, to 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 reach, I mean to get to that point where you until you find what you want, until you find your style. Because that's that's how you learn. That's how like, okay, so how does this person draw noses? How does that person draw? faces yeah no that's actually a good point because thinking about it at gcse gcse art every single week you'd choose another artist and you try and copy their style mm -hmm. and yeah i guess some things stuck from that exactly and along the way you find yeah you find your your would you would you say that your that your style will be the same in let's say three years time Mm. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know, because I am someone that gets a bit bored easily, um, which is why I couldn't be an animator, unfortunately. <laughs> um, 
I don't know, because I think this is just how I draw. But then I do think um, maybe I'll get a bit bored and maybe mm -hmm. that's the subject matter I'll get bored with. I don't know. Or will I change how I draw? Mm. I think it might depend on technology and if there's like, anything new, like, because before Fresco, actually, I wasn't paint like doing this painterly style. So I, mm -hmm. maybe it depends what, what Adobe brings out next. Stay tuned and join in two years to find out if Hazel is still... <laughs> if I'm still using that pencil brush. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think it's 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 funny that you mentioned that because, I mean, you obviously you look at Fresco as, as a tool, uh, as a fantastic flexible tool. But then again, just look at it and use it as a tool. And, and I think you should not be too dependent on certain tools because at the end of the day, it's always funny because when, when I talk to people, uh, let's say, um, you know, I use a lot of, of the Wacom tablets, you know, the Cintiq and, and the Intros, and um, especially when back in the days when you could be on, on live shows and you talk about these tablets and to people and they go like, oh man, I wish I had a, I wish I had a tablet like this or that. I, I wish I had an iPad. I wish I had Fresco, whatever. Then I could draw. And then and sometimes I'm just like, well, if you can't draw now, any tool, soft or hardware, won't help you to to draw. You know, if you can't draw a face or a figure, having yeah. a better tablet or a different iPad, it's not gonna or help. even the different software wouldn't help you to draw a better, nicer looking uh, figure, right? Yeah, no, it's true, it's true. Um, but I do think my style changed when I moved from a Wacom tablet and Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it was quite heavily broken, actually. So oh, wow, okay. I couldn't do too much on it. No, the first um, example of digital illustration I did, I was doing with the trackpad on a on a Mac. What? Yeah. So I think my style changed from that to the Wacom tablet to the iPad. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Okay. And it did change. And I think just each time I got a little bit more refined. And this is what I was um, talking about earlier, like the outcome of what I draw now, I think is more polished actually. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, perhaps I don't like that. Perhaps I'll go in and yeah, wrap it up a little bit, add some more sketchy lines. Mm -hmm. Tony uh, writes that was probably a very dramatic shift in style, which I, I assume <laughs> so as well. <laughs> oh, it was. It really and uh, another, another interesting um, comment from Tony was, uh, when we talked earlier about using multiple sources, about synthesizing, yeah. Jackie writes that my kid's school teacher, um, my, my kid's school teaches it as a magpieing, taking a little from lots of other people. Um, Akashanka says, even I love traditional way of painting like block printing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's also interesting to hear and to see. Yeah, try everything and see what sticks. Like, like throw in like a, like a dish of spaghetti onto the wall and see what, <laughs> what sticks and what does not. Yeah, interestingly though, um, I was going to talk about this, but at university we had this project one week, which was um, find an object or find an interesting object. So I picked this little mask from a charity shop and we had to bring it into class. And then the homework or the assignment that week was to draw it in a hundred different ways. Mm. And, you know, you start off, like, oh, I'm just going to draw it with a pencil. Oh, I'm going to draw it with a pen. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to draw it like, without taking the pen off the paper. Oh, I'm going to draw mm -hmm. it with the style of Van Gogh. And then when you get to about 60, you really get stuck. So that's when you start thinking like outside the box. Like, oh, I'm going to get this ketchup and draw it in ketchup or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's actually, I think, a really nice approach to when you get stuck to to force yourself to try something else and to find something new. I think that's... I think I'm going to try that. Yeah. See how many different ways you can draw. Yeah. Because you get so invested in your, in your daily routine and your daily, like, Oh, this is all, this is like, I always done it, you know? And like, sometimes you have to break free of that. Yeah. I think um, maybe that's where I am. Like if I'm being honest, maybe that's where I am right now. Like I'm in a routine. I mm -hmm. You know, I'll get the brief and I'll churn it out in the way I always churn it out. And mm -hmm. I've kind of lost that creativity and that searching for the style and trying out different things. Um, so I think maybe that's the next step once you've actually found your style, like getting stuck in the style. 
mm-hmm. and then getting yourself out of it. So hopefully, actually, in three years, I will have changed a bit. There's some, there's some, uh, the chat is exploding with some comments here. Um, so Tony writes, there's a, an excellent little book called Freehand that explores drawing styles. Karina is writing, there's also a book called A Hundred Ways to Draw a Bird, which sounds very, both sound very mm-hmm. sim- similar to uh, what we've been talking about. And um, Suhai writes, um, and you can see the animator working at the table, pulling faces in a mirror while she draws to get the expressions right. I will try to find it on YouTube, which is actually going back to that reference example of, you know, looking at like, how does a little grimace look like um, in order to like visualize it, like actually do it, visualize it and then draw it. Definitely. I find it really interesting um, with different, artists and just how many approaches there are to drawing faces and Mm -hmm. how that can actually be quite iconic. I remember I'd just spend hours when I was, I don't know, seven or eight, drawing Garfield out of books and like copying Garfield and like those eyes I can just like draw (laughs) naturally Mm -hmm. because they're so ingrained. But then you think about like the Simpsons or any kind of cartoon character that has something very stylized, it's become that. Yeah. Totally. Very recognizable. Yeah. Cool. Oh, wow. What was that? Actually, because I thought, oh, I better um, see what Carl's been up to. And he has uh, the other day, no, the other week, I think, um, come out with some winter brushes. And this was just, which one was this? Flaky, flaky fire. Ah, nice. Okay. I think that will. It will instantly give you those little, I mean, that's also something that saves you a lot of time to draw this up manually with all the little, you know, rays and splatters going off. Yeah. Take so some I time. Think, um, his brushes actually can, you know, you can pick one of those and make mm-hmm. that thing and that will, yeah, save you time and add a little something that you can keep keep using over and over. Absolutely. All right. Let's see if, if the audience has any more <laughs> Sean wants lens flares. <laughs> Well, we can, we can, we will certainly add this in After Effects once we get animated with this. Um, yeah, lens flares is something that I use, like not too often, but add them a little here and there, um, just to give it some more atmosphere and you know make it make it distinct, but more like not seeing them but actually feel them. It's something that I try to tell myself a lot. Um, sometimes when you overdo something, when it's just like too strong. You just take it back like 80 or 90 percent just so you have the hint of it you're just like like okay there's something going on but it doesn't you know jump out at, at you uh, in your face but rather you just like oh, okay there is something um that, that's something we have to do a lot in animation because sometimes you you tend to overdo it because it's like a new plugin or a new filter and you look and you just just add on it and it just screams lens flare it just screams effect x and y whatever uh, and then all the animators can see exactly what you've done. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he used uh, blah, 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 whatever. <laughs> I like that, like the subtlety of, of something. Mm-hmm. Cool. No no such thing as too much lens flares. Well, let's discuss that next time. <laughs> um, all right. I think, I think we're pretty much done. Uh, I'm, I'm good. I'm done. I hope that wasn't too, like, just one thing. I was showing hope that was all right no I think it was wonderful I mean I always try to you know when doing these streams I always trying to to also be the guest as well as the host like okay what what do I find inspiring and interesting and um well I have I have a few I have a few ideas right away um on how things could be changed up Ah, creative process so uh, I I hope everyone else is having similar thoughts and, and feelings in the audience so um yeah, any, anything you want to share before we wrap it up? Me or the... Me or the... You. <laughs> <laughs> Famous uh, last just, words. Uh, just thanks again for having me on. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. And... Um, oh, no, there was a bit of advice I wanted to share. Sure, um, shoot. Yeah, no, just try changing one or two things in, what, in your usual routine and mm-hmm. see what happens and see if you can yeah, find something that inspires you and something that will stick mm-hmm. progress your work fantastic that's, yeah that's going to make me think to do that as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh, yeah you should never stand still although you have settled on your style you should still 
be able to, you know, to progress it and push it further. Um, I'm sure it's going to uh, go on on Discord and uh, feel free to send any comments. Um, you can follow Hazel on Behance on Instagram. Um, let us know what you, what you think. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, so uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining this wonderful stream. I hope to see you soon again. And maybe we can also hop on the stream and uh, maybe we can get also animated with some of your work. That could be also a, oh, a good thing to do. Um, just throwing it out there since I did that with Melanie, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but that's maybe for next time. And um, yeah, I appreciate everyone watching. Thank you so much for your time, Hazel. It was wonderful. And uh, stay safe, everyone. And see you soon.